It is here. It is the Hong Kong International Races, the Long Jeans International Races coming up from Sha Tin on Sunday. An exciting day's racing, four Group 1s and almost 10 million sterling up for grabs in those four races and horses flying in from all over the world to challenge some of Hong Kong's finest horses. As we uh, welcome in Graham Cunningham. Uh, Graham, you were lucky enough to be there at Sha Tin last year for what was a, a strange year in that there were no crowds on track when normally you'd look at about 100,000 there at Sha Tin. Absolutely. Uh, that was my um, fifth consecutive uh, Longines IR day. It was the most unusual because of the COVID precautions, kept the crowd to an absolute minimum. Still a memorable day. Um, Mogul and Dan on Smash, Ireland and Japan, both ridden by Ryan Moore. Then Golden 60, the local superstar flying the Hong Kong flag, and then capped off with Zach Pert and completing the full set of Hong Kong Group 1s on Norm Core uh, in the Hong Kong Cup. So uh, it, it it's worth pointing out, Andrew, how much of an accomplishment it is just to get these races on at the moment. Uh, the Longines IJC last night, getting jockeys in from all over the world into a very, very tight, secure quarantine bubble, and all the horsemen and horsewomen and the horses themselves coming in from France, from Ireland, from Japan, etc. People from all over the world would normally be here in a massive crowd, including yours truly and myself. We're not there, but we're watching and we'll be watching some tremendous sport. And it started, as always, last night, Wednesday at Happy Valley with um, a very, very, very interesting uh, Longines International Jockeys Championship. The, um, uh, the golden couple of British racing, Holly Doyle and Tom Marquand on the board early, but Zach Purton's consistency won through. Four placings, I think, for Zach. Um, didn't win a race on the night, but captured the crown for the third time, I think. And um, it's very difficult to measure the quality of jockeys all over the world. It, it, it's not like tennis or even golf, where there's a scorecard and everyone plays the same track. These riders ride different horses in different places. But if there's a more accomplished, more clinical, more precise uh, jockey operator on the planet than Zach Burton at the moment, I don't think I've seen him. And that's the thing, you, as you say, he's uh, now made it three IJC wins. He's gone back to back there. Last year, he made the full set. And he's got some great rides coming up on Sunday in uh, one of the, or in all four of these uh, these Group One races coming up as uh, the Longines Hong Kong International races. We're going to dive right in and have a look at all four of these races, starting with the Hong Kong bars. Now this is the first of the races on Sunday in uh, race book order, and uh, it jumps about 5 p.m. for me down here in Australia, so that would make it about 6 a.m. in the UK. But definitely worth getting up and watching uh, horses like Pile Driver going. Around Around. Uh, we've got two winners uh, from the last two years in uh, Mogul and also Glory Vars. And uh, it really does look a race for the overseas horses. I'm curious what you make of Pile Driver coming off that uh, long break before winning the Churchill last time out. Yeah, expect this to go abroad again. It's gone to Europe or Japan in 10 of the 12 last 12 years, Andrew. I think it's gone to Europe 19 times overall. So the, the middle distance stayers, uh, this is their domain. Pile Driver is a very interesting story on many levels. Uh, a horse who was unsold at 10 grand as a yearling, um, a horse who represents a good yard, but not a top yard, in uh, William Muir and Chris Grassick. Martin Dwyer, his rider, won this race in 04 uh, on Phoenix Reach for Andrew Balding. He told me very vividly about how nervous he was that day when he looked around the paddock and he saw Sumion, Douglas White, Kinan, Fallon, Pellier, Mosse, etc. He's a, a much older, wiser, but still very capable jockey, and he's got a very talented horse in Pile Driver, who's had a light season because of a summer injury, but we know he's a Group One horse from his Coronation Cup win. He gave weight and a beating to some smart all-weather performers in the Churchill Stakes at Lingfield last time. He should run a very good race. If I have one slight nagging doubt, it's if the ground is very quick, fast turf at Chartin. When he got fast ground at Newmarket first time this season, he wobbled. He wandered to the left and to the right. But that's my only minor quibble with Pile Driver. With an international rating of 121, Andrew, he stacks up very well, not just for this race, but as the joint highest rated runner on the entire card this weekend. One horse who we know the ground's not going to be concerned for is Glory Vars, managed to win this race uh, back in 2019 and actually hasn't had that much racing since. Uh, Joe Marrera jumping aboard for the first time since that uh, big win at Sha Tin going back two years. 
Yeah, it's close, but I'm going to give him the edge for, for a couple of reasons. One is that he's been to Shartin and done it not once, but twice. Um, his Vars win two years ago. I think that is, in fact, I'm sure it is the most impressive mile and a half performance I've witnessed in Hong Kong. He beat a really good field that day. Uh, Deirdre was in there. Exultant was at the peak of his powers for Hong Kong. Um, uh, that good filly, uh, Lilac. What she Lucky called? Lilac. Lucky Lilac was in there. And he just ran clean away from them, Andrew. He has been lightly raced since, uh, but he ran very well. Second, coming home strongly behind Loves Only You in the QE2 Cup back at Shartin in the spring. I looked at his latest run, his prep run for this. And when I saw the result, I thought, why has he not won this race? When I looked at the video, I realized why he was given a very unusual ride. Mirko de Muro was on board. He made a huge swoop mid-race from the rear to stalk the leaders. And the horse did pretty well to hang in there for third. So I think he comes back in... I'm not saying he's quite as good as he was two years ago, but he's almost as good, and that might be good enough. The fact that Marrera jumps back aboard, I think, is very significant for Glory Vars. And uh, when you look at his form, he has been very consistent. He's only uh, really performed poorly and very poorly once, and that was in the Takarazuka Kinnan uh, going back 18 months. Uh, he didn't race again until uh, the uh, Kyoto Daishoten after that, so that was October. So he clearly wasn't right that day, um, but he's been he's been very good since. Uh, I do agree. This is a race that does look to be uh, for the internationals. Uh, I guess we have to also talk about Mogul. Uh, probably hasn't been quite at the peak of his powers this year. Uh, there was probably some query about the three-year-old crop last year, and I think that's borne out a little bit this year. He's a bit of a riddle to me, Mogul. Um, he's a gorgeous-looking horse with a tremendous pedigree, and he was really good in the Vars 12 months ago. It wasn't that deep a field, but he strung them out, and he looked a genuine Group 1 horse. He's now got an international rating, as you know, Andrew, of 111, which stacks up 10 pounds below his best. So the handicapper thinks he's regressed uh, this year. Um, the visual impression backs that up. Last time out in France, I think it was just a Group 3 race with no penalty, and he didn't hit the line hard at all. Aidan O'Brien thinks Hong Kong's fast ground will suit him much better, uh, and that could be true. Uh, that could be enough to get him into the mix again, but I must admit I would be surprised if Ryan and Aidan can pull another rabbit out of the hat this year with Mogul. And I'll quickly chat about uh, Ibeira as well. We saw uh, uh, the Aga Khan bring Daria Khana here in 2009. Uh, Ibeira getting back up to the 2,400 metres. Big story for his trainer, legendary French handler Alain de Roy Dupre. It's his last Group 1 runner of a stellar career with, uh, I think, at least 100 Group 1 winners, including this race with Daria Khana. She's a good quality filly. She didn't really shine last time, but prior to that, she'd been going along really well in Group 2 company. She'll be primed for this with Sumi on board. I think she might stay on into fourth or even third. Again, I would be surprised if she could beat the likes of a peak form Glory Vars. Alanda Rodepre, it's been, uh, as you say, quite a career. Uh, he, well known down here for having prepared American to win uh, a Melbourne Cup. And uh, he's just been such a globetrotting uh, trailblazer over the years. But, uh, uh, Graham, you're going with Graham, uh, with uh, Glory Vars? Yeah, I'm going to go 2 one eight, five. That'll be Glory Vars on top. Just a quick word for the home team. Reliable team might be the best of the bunch. He comes here on the back of what seems to be a personal best when he won the Jockey Club Cup over a mile and a quarter. It was a bit of a joke race, Andrew. He had a perfect passage, half a mile in 54 seconds, 1,200 metres in 79 and change. Uh, they walked through the first um, three quarters of that race and he reaped the benefit. I'd be very surprised if he could beat the best of the Euros and Japanese. I think it is Japan against Europe. It's Glory Vise to beat Pile Driver for me. And I'm with you there, Glory Vars, to be pile driver. Uh, I should give a quick mention to Columbus County, who did manage to run third last year, but hasn't won since. Uh, reliable team. He's reliable, but as you say, this is a very, very stiff class uh, test for him. Uh, for me, I think Glory Vars, probably one of the better uh, chances on the card uh, to be piled driver. Uh, we move on to the Hong Kong Sprint, 1,200 metres uh, this race coming up. Uh, as one of the more competitive races on the card. The Hong Kong sprinters generally perform well in this race, but of recent times, there hasn't been a standout performer. And if anything, they look a very, very even bunch this year. 
Agreed. Um, Hong Kong are hard to beat in this division. If you get a, a crack raider like Lord Kanaloa, it can be done. And if you get a horse who peaks just at the right time, it can be done for Japan with Dan on Smash, who won from stall 14 12 months ago. He's back again, uh, but he's not the only serious uh, Japanese contender here. Pixie Knight's an unusual horse, Andrew. I don't think a three-year-old has ever won this race. True, not many have tried, but he is getting good in a hurry at the moment. And his latest performance uh, when he won the Sprinter Stakes was pretty dominant. He beat Resistancia that day, an old rival of his. Dan on Smash was a couple of lengths further back. What do you make of that performance? Because to the naked eye, he looked like a proper Group 1 sprinter that day. He most certainly did. It was a very big performance, and we've seen horses come out of the sprinter stakes, most notably Lord Canaloa coming across to uh, perform very well in this race. I think the thing with this uh, sprinter's division over in Japan, it actually looks like quite a strong division at the moment. Uh, their sprinting stock generally isn't that uh, crash hot compared to the rest of the world. Uh, Lord Canaloa was... Uh, and a, a, you know, an outlier a little bit. He he really um, he produced the the most extraordinary uh, six furlong performance I've ever seen uh, when he sat three four deep and uh, won his final race in 2013, the Hong Kong Sprint. Um, that was just something that you you'll never see. And he managed to to really break records that day. It was uh, it was a phenomenal effort. Um, but I do think the Japanese this year are sending a very strong team between Dan on Smash between. Uh, Pixie Knight, and then obviously Resistentia, who uh, gets a bit of a better draw this time. Uh, Pixie Knight had the, the better draw in the Sprinter Stakes. Uh, Resistentia was out in 12, uh, managed to come across and, and sit handy. Uh, I know that uh, she's still drawn a little bit awkwardly in seven, but I get the feeling Sumion will probably be able to get across with the way that uh, the Hong Kong Sprinters line up here. So uh, for me, I do think the Japanese have a very strong chance this year. But uh, the Hong Kongers, as you say, can never really be uh, underrated in this race. And we've got a horse like Hot King Prawn, who's been at the, the top of the, the sprinting division there for a couple of years, uh, alongside the likes of uh, Lucky Patch, who really has emerged from nowhere to, to become that uh that uh, litmus test against these sprinters, uh, having won two of the main lead-ups, the Premier Bowl and then the Jockey Club Sprint. Yeah, we have a, a fair body of data that suggests the Hong Kong sprinters are good, but also that they can beat each other, which they have been doing on a frequent basis. So it's, it's a question of which horse can peak at the right moment. The one horse from the Hong Kong contingent who I think has the potential to really establish himself is Wellington. Uh, there's one performance in the Chairman Sprint Prize when he took on a lot of Sunday's rivals and he just quickened way too well for them. Um, let me have a look. He ripped home that day in 21.6 closer uh, for a high quality six furlong race. That's pretty impressive. And he was firmly in command of most of Hong Kong's best. He was only seventh, I think, on his reappearance. He had a setback in the autumn. So he's he's not been completely trouble free this time around. But it, it looked more like a getting to know you again ride. Uh, there wasn't too much waving of the whip from Alexi Bedell. Uh, Lucky Patch won that race. Um, Skyfield ran well. Courier Wonder, Nabu Attack were all in the mix. Likewise, Hot King Prawn. But I think it was one horse who can spring forward from that jockey club sprint. It could well be Wellington. As you said, this is a this is a wildly competitive race. Of the Japanese, I do like Pixie Knight. Something about his performance last time in the Sprinter Snakes that suggests he's probably still improving, which he's entitled to be as a three-year-old with just seven runs. Wellington, I think the best of the home contingent. I'm going to go four, two, five, and six here and take a chance that Richard Gibson has Wellington primed to go back to the level he showed in the Chairman Sprint Prize. And I think it's very important to note as well that both Hot King Prawn and Wellington carried the five pounds extra in the Group 2 lead-up uh, as Group 1 winners. So they meet them five pounds better. Both of them finished, uh, I think they finished seventh and eighth, Wellington seventh, Hot King Prawn eighth. But the thing is, uh, both of them were first up. Both will be better for the performance. And clearly, this is the uh, A game for them. This is the day where they're expected to perform to their best. Hot King Prawn might be past his best these days. Uh, it's just hard to tell. But uh, for me, I'm going with Resistentia. I'm with 12 to beat uh, Pixie Knight. I do agree with you there, too. And what a story it would be if Morris was to have a Hong Kong International Races winner in the sprint, having already won the mile.
trial and also the cup. Uh, that would be a fantastic story in and of itself. Uh, and then throwing in four and one as well. But uh, I, th I think it is a very competitive Japan Hong Kong race, and it's going to be really good to be able to tell where each of these sprinters lines up. So that is the Hong Kong sprint that uh, will come up at about 6.40 a.m. on Sunday morning. Definitely worth getting up for. Uh, there is a race in between. Uh, so that means that the next two races are a bit later in the morning. Uh, 7.50 a.m. will be the Hong Kong Mile, uh, the Long Jeans Hong Kong Mile over the 1,600 metres. Some great horses have won this race over the years. Uh, Morris has just mentioned uh, horses like uh, Good Barber, Able Friend, Beauty Generation, can Golden 60 join them uh, and join that elite group of horses that has managed to win this race more than once? Of course he can. If everything goes right, he ought to. Uh, but it's a horse race. Let's deal with um, the trends first. This is prime Hong Kong property, the mile. Uh, only Morris has been able to take it abroad in the last 15 years. So that tells you the Hong Kong milers are a very, very high quality bunch. Golden 60, at the moment, he stacks up he stacks up with the likes of Able Friend and Beauty Generation, and that is high praise indeed. Um, he's 18 from 19, Andrew, as you know. He's on a winning run of 15. Um, are we clutching at straws to try and get him beaten? All horses can have an off day. He hasn't had one since July 2019 on his fourth start. He's been pretty much flawless ever since. All horses, especially hold-up horses, can be traffic problems. It's seldom a problem for him because Vincent Ho is happy to come wide and let him uncoil that killer turn of foot wherever he's comfortable. Uh, but it's a question of potential value in the market. And it's also worth mentioning that this is the first time since this day last year that Golden 60 has met genuine international Group 1 opposition. He was tremendous in this race last year. He's been tremendous for the most part ever since. But he's going to go around, I would think, at 1.4, 1.5. There is one horse in this race, Andrew, I think, who is a very, very serious danger to Golden 60, not just because he might get better traffic, he might get better run through the race. I think he is a real high-quality Group 1 miler waiting to announce himself this weekend. I'm going to be very interested to see who that is. But just going on about Golden 60, uh, as you said, it has been that uh, uh, that amazing ability to be able to find a way to win uh, ever since that race in, in July 2019. And from memory, the only reason that he actually ran in that July 2019 race was so that uh, Francis Loy needed to get a couple of wins on the board. Um, he was sent out uh, at the end of that season Um probably wasn't at his best. Well, we know he wasn't at his best, but uh, he, he had been rushed to the races that day. Um, apart from that, he's really just managed to hold himself in, uh, in that unbeaten era, that that, that unbeaten aura that, that, that uh, you know, horses so often in Hong Kong cannot find. Because the thing is, in Hong Kong, you do have to usually race against either set weights company, um, set weights and penalties company, as he did in the Group 2 last time out, or they race in the handicaps. So for him to be able to, to put together the win streak that he has, um, it, it is rare air. Only Silent Witness, Beauty Generation have really been able to match him uh, in that sphere, which which already puts him in that uh, that that big uh, group of horses that uh, th those legendary horses in Hong Kong but as you say international competition is the one uh, query here and uh, we do have some very nice Japanese horses coming across in the likes of Danon Kingley, uh, Salios, Vindegard uh, and I'm also going to be very interested to see um, I should mention Indy Champ there as well and uh, but I'm going to be very interested to see what Mother Earth can do as well um, it, it's so, so rare to see a thousand guineas winner coming to Hong Kong. Mm. Just to finish off on Golden 60, he can run each sectional, as you know, faster than the last. And when a horse can rip home in a good mile race in 21.5, there's only so much you can do as an opponent. So if he's going to do that again this weekend, he'll probably overwhelm them all. But Dan and Kingley, I've teased you long enough, mm. <laughs> really looking forward to here. He's a five-year-old who has been operating at a high level in Japan for quite a while. I think he's at the peak of his powers now. The form book backs that up. If you look what he's done on his last 
couple of runs in the Yasuda Kinen at Tokyo in June. He battled home in tremendous style. He beat Gran Allegria, who is the darling of Japanese race fans. Schnellmeister, a real up and coming three year old at the time, has franked the form since. Indy Champ was behind. Selios was behind. There's no reason why those horses should reverse the form. He's run again since. He was pipped in a group two at Tokyo in October, a head second to Schnellmeister. It does not tell the full tale at all. Have a look at the video. Um, I don't know why, but his rider seemed determined to make this huge sweeping move um, just before halfway. He must have beaten about, passed about seven or eight horses. He then quickened again to pass another four or five to hit the lead until Schnellmeister just ran him down. So that performance was more than enough to suggest that Danon Kingley is still in exactly the sort of form he showed to win a red hot Yasuda Kinen. And um, I think he'll get not necessarily first run, but have a look at this race, Andrew. There are no front runners on deck. None. Mm -hmm. Zero. This promises to be a very, very slow, slow, quick race. That's not necessarily against Golden 60, but I do think Dan on Kingley might be the type of horse to quicken first, and then Golden 60 is likely to come screaming home late. Maybe it'll be in time. Maybe maybe it'll be a bit too late. But at the prices, I'm very happy to take a chance that Dan on Kingley is one of the value bets of 22, 2022 IR week. What really interests me here is uh, uh, Salios uh, against... Uh, against uh, 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 Danon Kingley, just because Salios was once this very hyped up horse. Um, I'm losing my <laughs> I'm losing my my uh, thought process here a bit, but uh, Salios was once very exciting. He was considered to be uh, one of two very good two year olds there in Japan. Um, he won the Asahi High Futurity. The other was Contrail who uh, won the hopeful stakes. They clashed in the 2000 guineas, uh, the Satsuki show. Uh, Contrail managed to beat him as he did in the derby. Now, I was expecting Salios to do a lot more as a four-year-old. Um, he's really disappointed, to be to be frank. And I'm going to be very curious to see what he does on uh, Sunday, just because Damien Lane takes the ride for the first time since uh, riding him uh, in the Japanese derby last year. It's just, it, it's, it's a very strange a move from a, a trainer like Noriyuki Hori, who has such a very good record at the Hong Kong International Races. I think he's had nine starters for three winners um, in the last 13, 14 years. Um, he's brought a, a, a team over this year, but Salios is one who interests me, especially blinkers off. He's a bit of a quirky horse. I wouldn't be surprised to see him improve uh, for Noriyuki Hori, although, as you did mention, he has a lot of ground to make up on Danon Kingley on exposed form and raw form. Mm. As you mentioned, the Hong Kong team, <clears throat> besides Golden 60, uh, I think the obvious ones, um, again, are Waikuku and last year's derby winner, uh, Sky Darcy. Uh, Waikuku, I think he's, he's only had three goals at Golden 60, but he's been beaten fair and square on each occasion. Logic suggests uh, he will be again this weekend, but he should run another solid race. And uh, Sky Darcy, I think, is primed to run a good race. So I'm going to go two, one, four, and eight. But when you fancy one, Andrew, you need to tell people. And I fancy Dan and Kingley this weekend. We'll be on Dan on Kingley then. I think anyone who's watching this with your air of confidence, and especially with the value, uh, will be with Dan on Kingley this weekend. Just before we uh, move on to the Hong Kong Cup, I just would be interested to get your thoughts on a horse like Excellent Proposal. Classic mile winner, hasn't met these horses, uh, the the likes of the Waikukus, the, the more than this, has met Sky Darcy, obviously, but uh, meeting Golden 60 for the first time, uh, is there any chance for him to be able to improve now that he comes back to set weights from a uh, handicap company? Yeah, well, it's absolute reasons why he'll improve because uh, it was clear for all to see that he was unlucky last time in a good quality a handicap. He had nowhere to go on his reappearance the time before. He didn't get a particularly smooth trip. So there are reasons to think he can improve, but he absolutely needs to. It, it's not a case of three or four pounds improvement. We'll get the job done he needs to progress by double digits if he's going to get amongst the very best of these. 
So personally, I must admit, I'm with the Japanese. Uh, I do have to to follow Salios in just with this Noriyuki Hori angle, uh, and I'm hoping Dan on Kingley as well might be able to uh, knock off Golden Sixty. So I'm going six, two, one, and uh, throwing in the four as well. Uh, as you say, Waikuku probably runs well. I was uh, uh, cheering him hard in the Jockey Club uh, mile, but Golden Sixty with that electric turn of foot, as you say, when horses can run those sorts of splits, they're very, very hard to beat. It's at the uh, we move. Points, but but with Vincent Hull, it, it's a really interesting challenge for him this weekend. He has enormous faith in this horse, and Golden Sixty seems to repay it every time. But perhaps this is is the trickiest puzzle so far because it's the double whammy. Absolutely no pace dialed in on paper, and I think perhaps I think Dan and Kingley. I know Beauty Generation was in the race last year but he was past his very best. I think in terms of being at the peak of his powers right now, Dan on Kingley is perhaps the best horse beauty um, uh, Golden 60 has ever faced in Hong Kong so far. And just to get your thoughts on this, is that ability to be able to take on the best from abroad an opportunity for him to really prove himself as a world-class horse? Because really at the moment, he's just beating the same horses time and time again. It's a really good point. Um, taking your show on the road is not imperative if you're to be uh, a superstar nowadays, but it doesn't half help. Uh, it really does. If you're uh, a Morris or a Highland Reel or a Love's Only You, we'll come to her shortly, your legacy is burnished and burnished massively by winning abroad uh, and winning abroad more than once in some cases. So if he could go to uh, Japan um, next June, is it? Um, that would be uh, fascinating. I have my reservations about whether that will ever come to pass, uh, but he needs to get Sunday out of the way first, and he's got to fear some Japanese um, foe or two in his way this weekend. Good luck to Golden 60. It's a tremendous story. It's a Hong Kong story through and through, and with both of us having lived there, you know what that means uh, to the city itself. So um, he, is the, he is the standard bearer for Hong Kong racing. Uh, no pressure, Vincent. That is a, a title that is not bestowed uh, lightly, that uh, being that Hong Kong flag bearer, that standard bearer. Uh, it is a lot of pressure. It is uh, a position that any Hong Kong owner wants to be in. But uh, when you get to these big races, certainly the pressure does dial up. Uh, we move to the Hong Kong Cup, which is the richest race on the Hong Kong calendar. 2,000 metres before them here. And again, it does look a race where the locals are lacking uh, and it does look a race where it is going to be Japan versus Europe and it is going to be a cracking race really because uh, when you look at the, the likes of uh, Dubai Honor and um, uh, Bolshoi Ballet, uh, Max Sweeney coming across uh, for uh, the, the Europeans, uh, and then taking on the likes of uh, the Japanese here in, in Love's Only You coming off uh, that Breeders' Cup win, also Le Papali. Um, I'll start with the Japanese, just to, to follow on from what we've been saying about the Japanese so far, because uh, I think both of us at the moment are predicting a Japanese clean sweep, at least of the first three races. So I'm going to be curious, is that going to be the case for uh, the fourth race? Are you with the Japanese? Um, I don't think I am. I think they'll probably get at least two of the first four places and maybe even three. Uh, but I think there might be one British horse, more of him in a moment, um, to give them plenty to think about. On the data front, Japan have won four of the last six, Andrew. They know exactly uh, what level they need to be at to win the Hong Kong Cup. Europe, strangely, uh, have been blank since Snow Fairy won back in oh, 2010. 10, I think. Yeah, 2010, yeah. I think it was, yeah. More than a decade since Europe won this race. Uh, Dubai Honor uh, looks a serious contender. Loves Only You um, is hard to knock in any way. Uh, Hong Kong 4, yes, she has it. She beat Glory Vars in the QE2 Cup uh, back in the spring, and he might frank that form early on uh, Sunday. Uh, Breeders' Cup filly and mile turf, a wild finish. Uh, she put her brave head through a narrow gap to get up close home. First ever Japanese Breeders' Cup winner. She is a real pathfinder for Japan. She is... She's not a horse with a, an instant turn of foot, but she quickened better than I thought she would at Del Mar in that short straight. So she's pretty versatile. She's hard. She travels really well. Um, she's got to be high on anyone's shortlist this year. 
And Yoshita Yohagi getting a double there, uh, also managing to win the Breeders' Cup distaff. But uh, he's been uh, a trainer that we've seen plenty in Hong Kong. Uh, you'll spot him from a mile away with his, uh, his different hats that he wears. Uh, but it's been great to see him really step up and lead this Japanese assault on the world stage. Yeah, it adds so much to those global occasions when when the long distance travellers come and make a mark. Sometimes they're underestimated in the market, as we saw uh, with the American betting public didn't really take much notice of the Japanese runners. That mistake will not be made in Hong Kong. They're pretty clued up about the strength of the Japanese form. Um, there's not too much in it. Um, we'll come to Le Papali and Hishi Iguazu in a moment. But I think that Love's Only You might might just be the strongest of the Japanese contingent this year. Leia Papali coming off a run against the Mayors last time out, the Queen Elizabeth II Cup. Uh, she finished fourth. It was a, a pretty even fourth, you'd say, uh, but did manage to win the Osaka High going back earlier this year. And the Osaka High has quickly developed into to one of Japan's leading 2,000 metre races. It has. There's one little rider on that performance. Uh, the ground was yielding and probably softer than yielding that day, and she really blossomed on it. She kicked for home a long way out, and she just ground her way clear. There are going to be very different conditions uh, this weekend. <clears throat> she's a good filly on fast ground, Le Papali, but I think she's a better filly when you get heavy rain, and I don't see any typhoon forecasts uh, in the predictions for this weekend. And Hishi Iguazu, we talk about good uh, trainers, uh, good globetrotting trainers, and Noriyuki Hori, we've already mentioned his outstanding strike rate at Sha Tin uh, in December. He brings Hishi Iguazu across, who really has jumped out of the ground uh, at last four or five runs. Uh, now, they've been spaced over quite a bit of time. You're going back to April last year for, for the first of a win streak that uh, uh, culminated in the Nakayama McKinnon earlier this year. Ran pretty well as well in the Tenno Show autumn. Uh, obviously needs to be kept in a bit of cotton wool, but uh, uh, the type of horse who, who again, has just been uh, stepping up to the mark every time that, that uh, a, a, he's been asked to do so. Yeah, he's solid, but he does have something to find when you bear in mind that Loves Only You is international rated 118, so is Le Papali. Hishi Iguazu is 114 and has to give away the Phillies allowance. Uh, he was pretty much all out to win his group two. His fifth uh, in the Tenno Show Autumn was behind Euphoria, who I think is a terrific horse, and a mighty contrail. So he was in very deep that day. He didn't have any excuses, and I think he'll run his race this weekend. But when I look at the ratings, 118 Loves Only You, likewise Le Papali, Likewise, Max Swinney, Hishi Iguazu is 114, so um, he needs to find a little, a little extra uh, to match strides with the best of these. And we move on to the Europeans, and uh, I think you and I might be thinking quite similarly here, but uh, uh, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, we talk about uh, combinations who really have uh, performed abroad, and Haggis and Markland uh, really have uh, been able to, to travel and win big races. We've seen it in Australia a couple of times with the day of, and they combine here with uh, Dubai Honor, who was very good in the champion stakes last time, albeit lugging in a little bit. Yeah, this could be right horse, right place, right time, I think. This Haggis Mark one axis is it's getting increasingly powerful. Um, he's weirdly perfect, Tom Marquand. Um, he, he seems to do it in Australia. He does it in Europe. He never gets suspended. He's always smiling, saying the right things to the media. Uh, what's wrong with this guy? Uh, but he's got a, a great opportunity on Dubai Honor, who has an interesting backstory himself. Um, he was a bit of a, a boyo uh, through the winter. He, he wasn't handling himself well at home. William Haggis sent him off to uh, do some remedial work with Laura Collett, who is an um, Olympic gold medalist, uh, three-day eventer. Um, and she... Um, worked some magic on him. He came back a much more professional racehorse. Only got started this year in June, ran very well on the wrong side of the track in the Britannia, won a good handicap at Newmarket on fast ground, captured a couple of strongish group twos on soft ground uh, in France in the autumn, and then ran his best race yet when going down fighting behind Sealy Way in the Kipco Champion Stakes Group 1 at Ascot. It was soft ground. It was towards the end of a busy season for some. But the fact remains that the Derby and King George hero Adea was behind. The Saudi Cup and Judmont International winner Mishrif was behind. It was a legitimately strong international Group 1 race. And he went down fighting despite pulling a bit harder than ideal. 
So I, I, I have to think that um, he's a major player this weekend. Haggis has a hunger now. He is he is an elite trainer uh, in Britain, but he has these big races in Australia, in America, in Hong Kong targeted now. He knows he needs to to win those races to be regarded in the same breath as Gosden, as Stout, as Kumani, all those global pioneers, etc. I think he might have the right type of horse here. Nobody had really heard of this horse until June, but he's making his own reputation now. And Dubai honor. Don't be surprised if he's held up with a bit to do. Don't be surprised if he races quite keenly early on. But he does have a right turn of foot, a really good turn of foot. And that can be very valuable at this level. It's very interesting to see him by Pride of Dubai, who's a an Australian stallion who who was a Group One winning juvenile, but uh, not really a stallion that's uh, highly rated by by any means. But uh, uh, great to see Dubai on a performing for him, and uh, very happy uh, to to be looking his way myself. But uh, if we are looking at Dubai Honor, we also have to look at Max Sweeney, given uh, Max Sweeney uh, obviously was third in that Champion Stakes. Um, I guess the the query for me would be genuine good ground with Max Sweeney. Yeah, I agree. Um, he's a dual group one winner. Um, um, it's a classic winner. He won the Irish Guineas on very testing ground. And he ran really well, a couple of lengths behind Dubai on, a, on the soft ground at Ascot. Now, if you take that race in isolation, you watch the video, you wouldn't find it easy to make a strong case for Max Sweeney reversing the form when you add in the fact that the racing surface is going to be much faster this weekend. I think it adds to the to the view that Dubai Honor is the better of the pair. And uh, Bolshoi Ballet coming off an American campaign, had the four starts over in the uh, US, uh, went through that new turf triple that they've got in New York and managed to win the first leg. Uh, uh, from memory, it was the Belmont Derby. Um, it was placed behind a Cox Plate winner uh, in the Saratoga Derby, ran fourth as well in the Jockey Club Derby, and then sixth last time out in the Breeders' Cup turf. Uh, Aidan O'Brien, Ryan Moore, obviously a potent combination, but it does look like Bolshoi Ballet has something to find here. Agreed. Uh, I wasn't the only one to fall for him in the spring. I, I was convinced he was a, a potential derby winner. Plenty others were. He went off 11 to 8 favourite at Epsom. He did get an injury uh, that day, so he gets a pass for that. But it's hard to give him a pass on some of his more recent efforts, including in the Breeders' Cup turf, when he ran respectably. But he had every possible chance and he finished only six, I think, behind Yubia. So uh, he needs to find a little bit extra. We have seen it before with Highland Reel coming from the Breeders' Cup turf to this race and excelling. But as things stand, Bolshoi Ballet does not have the same sort of credentials, same sort of CV as Highland Reel. I could see him running very respectably. I'd be surprised if he was good enough to beat the very best and, and finish first. And we do have to give some mention to the local brigade. Again, most of them coming out of the Jockey Club Cup, which was, as you mentioned earlier, a farcically run race, uh, won by a reliable team. What do you make of the local contingent? Uh, well, Panfield, uh, Panfield is rated 116 and Kying Star is rated 117. That puts them in the mix. I could be dead wrong. I think they might be a little bit flattered uh, by those racings. And Panfield was just uh, disappointed by him uh, last time. I expected much better. Kying Star, as we know, is a natural forward goer. He's a key horse tactically. But when he goes in against the very best, Andrew, whether it's a mile or a mile and a quarter, he tends to come up just short. So um, Japan have won four of the last six. Europe have been blank since uh, 2010 and Snow Ferry. That drought can end this weekend. Uh, right horse, right place, right time for Aussie Tom. Could be Hong Kong Tom before long. Dubai honour for William Haggis in the cup for me. I'm with Dubai Honor as well. Uh, eight for me to beat 12 and 11. I'm thinking the Japanese mares can run well. And I reckon of the locals, I'm going to be interested to see what Turbion Diamond can do coming off that ladies' purse win. Um, again, was down in the weights that day, 113 pounds. So does have to step up to set weights. But when you do look at the rest of them, it's it's difficult to make a case for the Hong Kong uh, contingent. For me as well, uh, I was expecting more from Panfield. And the fact that he wasn't able to quicken in a race uh, like that, uh, that was slowly run, uh, I was hoping to see a bit more tactical versatility from him uh, that just simply wasn't on display last time out. So uh, I personally would have preferred if uh, Tony Millard had have gone to the bars rather than the cup. But... Uh, Look, I know Tony believes he's a 2,000 metre horse and he's going to get a chance here in what is likely to be a different run race to yeah. what he struck in the Jockey Club Cup. Yeah, but overall, it, it's a great weekend. Um, 
you want the best possible cast of jockeys and horses when you put on a party like this. But just imagine all four races in the IJC, Andrew, won by visiting jockeys. Is it possible that all four races, I think for the first time ever in IR history, could go to uh, Japan and Europe between them? Who knows? But between the sprint, the mile, the vase and the cup, um, uh, it's a great way to the end the year in Hong Kong. The only pity is that we aren't there. Who knows if everything goes to plan and the world gets back to normal in the next 12 months, maybe we can be there in person next year because um, it's two days out now, three days out from IR day and I'm starting to get itchy feet. So am I, I must admit. It's uh, quite wet here uh, where I'm based in Sydney and I'm thinking about that nice weather, uh, that 24, 25 degrees in Hong Kong and just thinking what a lovely race day it will be on Sunday. It's always a great race day and uh, it will be uh, quite something if the, the raiding party manages to take all four races, which does look very possible. But uh, the Hong Kong horses, you can never write them off and Golden 60 will be there ensuring that uh, Hong Kong has every chance of at least keeping one title on uh, on home soil. Uh, Graham, I've got to ask, which is your best of all of those four? Uh, which is your best value as well? I think I already know the answer to that, but your best and your best value for the four races. Well, let's run through them one by one in distance, uh, going up in distance. In the sprint, I think it's wildly difficult. I couldn't be massively confident. I think the key horses for Japan are Pixie Knight, who's improving fast, and for Hong Kong and Wellington, who's still pretty lightly raced, and he is much better than he showed on his reappearance. His chairman sprint um, prize win uh, stands out. Uh, that's the sprint. I'm not wildly confident. The mile, I think there's a really good bet, a value bet to take on Golden 60, both in the win place markets and definitely in the Quinella. Uh, I think Golden 60 and Dan on Kingley are the standout horses, and there's going to be a gulf in the price between the two. So I'm very happy to take a chance that Dan and Kingley's high quality mile form in Japan can be transferred to Hong Kong at Sha Tin this weekend. Uh, in the Vars, I'm going to go with Glory Vars to win this for the second time. Uh, Highland Reel uh, won this in his first visit, was beaten on his second and won on his third visit to the Vars. Glory Vars won on his first visit, missed last year, but he came back to Hong Kong in the spring over 2000 and ran very well. John Marrera is a major plus for Glory Vise, who can win the Vars at the expense of Piledriver. And in the Cup, 2,000 metres, it's Europe versus Japan. It's Dubai Honour versus Loves Only You. I'm going to go with Dubai Honour. Uh, I think he's I think he's coming good at the right time. I think the race will be run to suit him. But in terms of value, um, it's Dan on Kingley all the way. I think in terms of an each way win and place bet and in Quinellas with Golden 60, he stands out as a as a really, really interesting horse. The market's going to be very interesting in all those races, but the one I'll be watching particularly keenly is the mile for Dan on Kingley. For me, I'm with you on those two uh, longer distance races. Glory Vars for me in the Vars, uh, Dubai Honour in the Cup, uh, hoping to see an English victory. I went back and checked it was 2010, the last uh, the last uh, international or the last European win in the Cup. So hopefully Dubai Honour able to uh, follow in the footsteps of Snow Fairy. Uh, and then I do think the Japanese can win both the sprint and the mile, but I'm hoping that uh, a couple of different horses there, Resistencia in the sprint, um, again, just thinking with that better draw, might be able to uh, defeat Pixie Knight and uh, looking to Sally Oss as an each way bet in the mile. But it is one of those races where anything could happen and I do think you have to be against Golden 60 at what is likely to be a very short quote given that this is going to be a very different race to anything that he's contested in the last uh, 24 months so really? hoping Golden 60 can get the job uh, can can get, can get beaten but if he gets the job done won't be too disappointed given he is really that banner horse for Hong Kong in what has been a difficult time for Hong Kong and for, for everyone uh, around the world so it is uh, great to have that international competition still alive it's great to be able to enjoy international racing wherever we're watching from whether it be from here in australia over there in the uk graham where will you be watching uh, sunday's race meeting i'll be getting up early watching in my living room and um i'm also doing a bit of scribbling i'm doing the race report for the hong kong cup uh for the jockey club team so i'll need to uh i'll need to gen up on all my japanese uh connections <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, memories right there. They were uh, great times being able to write those reports. Um, I'll be I'll be reading with uh, great anticipation. I can't wait for uh, your report and the Jockey Club's team to send out all the reports, uh, some great content there from the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, hopefully you can find a winner. Good luck with all of those uh, selections on Sunday. Thanks, mate. And thank you for joining us on this preview of the Hong Kong International Races, the Long Jeans International Races coming up on Sunday morning. Uh, don't forget to tune in. And if you are having a bet, gamble responsibly.